my mother, uh, on my mother's side, I come from uh, many generations of farmers. Uh, my mom's roots uh, stretch deep in the cornfields of western Illinois. Uh, her father, my grandfather, uh, Charles Kingdon, and I bear his um, name, his last name is my middle name, Paul Kingdon Nelson. Charles Kingdon uh, farmed uh, corn and soybean. And uh, the Kingdon family actually goes clear back to the late 1700s, uh, farming there in, uh, in and around the small farming town of Brinfield, Illinois. Well, uh, Charles Kingdon married Mildred Porter, also from a farming family there in the Brimfield area. Now, my, my Grandpa Charlie, my Grandpa Kingdon, was a progressive when it came to farming. And so he was willing to try new methods. And one method that caused quite a stir in the 1930s was leaving the stalks and the leaves and the debris after harvest and letting them rot in the field. Uh, traditionalists always cleaned up the fields uh, after harvest. My mother remembers uh, going to dinner at her grandma and grandpa Porter's house, Mildred Porter's parents. And Grandpa Porter was a small, wiry, traditional farmer and so when they would come to dinner my mom remembers as a little girl her father Charlie and Grandpa Porter getting into it about these newfangled ways of farming and uh, Grandpa Porter thought this leaving the trash in the fields was just like the worst thing you could possibly do and so the conversation would start voices would raise it would get a little heated and then there would be silence because Grandpa Porter would get to a point in the conversation where he would fold his arms, close his eyes, and refuse to speak. <laughs> it was done. There was no more conversation. Mom and her parents and sisters would pack up and go home because Grandpa Porter was done. He just shut down. Now, I, I hope you're not like my Grandpa Porter. I hope that uh, you are open and you are teachable. And you don't suffer from the hardening of the categories. And that takes a while for you. <laughs> but that you're always open and teachable to new ideas that are backed up by solid evidence. That you're always open. And you're not like my Grandpa Porter. But as we've been studying the scriptures, as we've been studying Romans 9 through 11, we discover that the nation of Israel, the spiritual leaders of Israel, were like my grandpa Porter, and they folded their arms and they closed their eyes to the evidence when Jesus came the first time, that he was, in fact, their promised Messiah. Now, as you know, that through the Old Testament prophets, God revealed that he was going to send a deliverer who would deliver us from the consequences of the fall that he would defeat the serpent, and that he would reverse the consequences of the fall and restore paradise. And God promised that this Messiah would come through the nation of Israel. And yet when he came his first time, the spiritual, spiritual leaders of Israel were like my grandpa Porter, with their eyes closed to the overwhelming evidence that Jesus presented validating his claim to be that promised Messiah. Let's stop and think about it. He was born of a virgin. That fulfilled the prophecies of Genesis 3.15 and Isaiah 7. He was born as a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through the tribe of Judah, and specifically within the tribe of Judah, the line of David. That fulfilled prophecies from Genesis chapter 49 and 2 Samuel chapter 7. Not only that, he was born in the little tiny village of Bethlehem. That fulfilled a clear prophecy in Micah. When he was 12 years old, he astounded the chief priests and the scribes, the experts in the law. He astounded them at, at age 12 with his knowledge and understanding of the Torah. 
when he began his public ministry, in addition to the many miracles and healings he accomplished, he accomplished three miracles that the rabbis taught could only be accomplished by the Messiah. And those three miracles were the healing of a man born blind, the healing of a Jewish leper, and the casting out of a demon that caused muteness. The Jewish rabbis had written over the centuries that those are miracles that only the Messiah can accomplish. And Jesus accomplished all three. On the week of his crucifixion, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the bull of a donkey. A clear, clear fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. The means by which Israel as a nation would recognize her Messiah and her king. Jesus eventually submitted to crucifixion on the cross, which fulfilled prophecies from Psalm 16, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, and Daniel 9. And then, ultimately, he rose on the third day, fulfilling prophecies in Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. I mean, the evidence was overwhelming. This is your Messiah. We often don't understand that Jesus, after his resurrection, was seen by 500 men at one event, at one time, and he spent 40 days with his disciples in the Galilee, visible to all, for 40 days after his resurrection. And yet there were the spiritual leaders of Israel. Just obstinate. Obstinate and stubborn in their rejection of Jesus as their Messiah. Israel remains hardened in their rejection of Jesus to this day. Now as we know... In addition to promises of the Messiah, God also promised that the nation of Israel would come under the new covenant, that God would make a new covenant with Israel, and in that day, every Jew would be saved. Every Jew would be reconciled to God. Every Jew alive at that time would stand in a right relationship with God. And yet you and I know that the nation of Israel has not yet entered into and experienced the promises of the new covenant. In fact, the vast majority of Jews today, as it has been for the last 2,000 years, are separated from God in their unbelief. And not only do they rec uh, reject Jesus as their Messiah, they also reject God's basis of salvation, which is justification by faith. If a Jew is religious at all, and not a Messianic Jew, then they follow the official Jewish teaching that the way a person is made right with God is through keeping the law and doing good works. That's the official teaching of Judaism. Now, I share these things with you, and I, I get loud and I get intense, but I'm, this is a matter of heartbreak that the nation of Israel has not yet entered into the new covenant, has not yet been saved as a nation, and has suffered horribly over the last 2,000 years. Now, praise God, as we have studied, in every generation of this dispensation, God has elected Jews to be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And so, uh, by His grace, there has always been, in every generation, a believing remnant of Jews because of God's grace and election. You see, that's what Paul revealed and we studied last week in Romans 9. He was explaining the present condition of Israel, why Israel is not yet saved, and why so few Jews throughout Israel's history, including up to the present, why so few Jews believe and are saved, and it's because of God's election, God's sovereignty, that God has, God has limited the number of descendants of Abraham who will receive his covenant promises, and that 
that group is called the remnant because they are a very small percentage of the worldwide citizens of Jews. But praise God that in every generation, as I've said, there is a remnant who believe because of God's election. Because left on their own, none of them would believe. Now, in Romans 10, uh, beginning with chapter 9, verse 30, Paul is explaining from the human side why Israel has not yet received the covenant promises, why Israel is not yet saved, why, the, why there is only a remnant. Romans 9 was from the divine side, God's sovereignty. Romans 10 is from the human side, the human responsibility that Israel bears for her condition. Let's look at chapter 9, verse 30, where we, again, are looking at the human side of Israel's partial hardening. We've studied that. Israel believes righteousness can be earned by keeping the law. Israel believes righteousness can be earned by keeping the law. Paul writes in verse 30, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have, atta have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For, being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. As I mentioned, to this day, official Judaism teaches that the only means of a right relationship with God is by keeping the law and doing good works. And in fact, Judaism alone is not alone in her rejection of justification by faith. Because among all the world religions, biblical Christianity is the only one that teaches the truth that justification is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. All other world religions teach a salvation that is based on our works, on our trying to make ourselves right with God. And I hope you understand by this time that trying to be justified by your works is impossible. Any idea that you can make yourself right with God by doing good deeds is impossible because there is no way for you to offset, there's no way for me to offset all the many ways that I fail to honor and glorify God, my creator, in attitude and action. There's no way I can offset and pay for that. And yet, God, who is just and right, must punish my evil, must punish our evil, or he will violate his character, and he will violate justice and righteousness. Now, I can take that punishment, but in so doing, I will remain separated from God for all eternity in the lake of fire. God, out of his great love for you and for me, provided another to take the punishment for us. And that is Jesus Christ. And when he died on the cross, God placed the guilt of all of our sin, past, present, and future, placed it in his body on the tree. And he took the penalty for us. So that if we, by faith, will trust in that good news that God, in Jesus, paid the penalty for our sin, all of our sin will be forgiven. And God will declare us right in his eyes and his Holy Spirit will come to live within us, and our new life will begin that will never end. We will be with God and with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the righteous angels, and all those who have believed for all of eternity. That comes by faith in Jesus, not by keeping the law. And I hope you understand that by now. 
And if you have, up to this moment, been trying to make yourself right with God, that you will give up that endeavor. Don't be like Israel, but rather trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to be made right with God. And you will be, and your life will be changed forever. Now, after sharing the way of faith, that it is by faith, and uh, that it is the way of salvation, that is by faith and not works, Maybe you've had this happen, but I, I have had people say to me that I've had the joy of sharing the gospel with, they reject it initially by saying, it can't be that easy. Have you had anybody say that to you? It can't be that easy. How can God just forgive us like that and not require us to toe the line, you know, to keep the Ten Commandments? What's going to What's going to keep us on the straight and narrow if God just gives it to us? So you can understand why people reject justification by faith. It's too easy. But Paul affirms it is, wasn't easy for Jesus. And we're trusting in what he did for us. And that this way of salvation was available and is available not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. As we go to verses 5 through 13, what Paul is teaching is that justification by faith in Jesus is available to all. He starts in verse 5. He says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. Remember, that's how Israel believes they can be saved, is by keeping the law. And let me ask you this. Why did a significant number of the 613 commandments have to do with animal sacrifice? Why did so many of the commandments have to do with animal sacrifice? Because God knew his people would fail to keep his law perfectly, and so he provided a way for their transgressions to be covered. You see, by the very presence of the, of the animal sacrifices, the blood sacrifices in the law, is already a divine recognition that the law, keeping the law, is not the way a person is going to be made right with God. It's already an admission, an acknowledgement that every man, woman, and child is going to break God's law, and God provides a blood sacrifice to cover their transgressions. And in so doing, he's also teaching and he's foreshadowing the ultimate blood sacrifice of the Messiah, Jesus, who as a human being can provide the sacrifice that removes forever the sin of other human beings who trust in him. So verse 5 reflects the Jewish perspective that the law can earn a person a right standing before God, but it's a complete misunderstanding of the law. Verses 6 through 13 assert that a right standing before God can only be secured by faith and that it doesn't require extraordinary effort. Notice what he says in verse 6, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead, but what does it say? The, this word or the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Now, we read this and think, what in the world is Paul saying? Well, he's actually reflecting quotes from Deuteronomy where Moses is saying to the nation of Israel at that time, he's saying, listen, you don't have to go over land and sea to find out what God's commands are for you. They're right here. They're right here. I'm teaching them to you. And in the same way, Paul is saying, the way of salvation isn't something that anybody needs to go hither and yon and exert extraordinary effort to try and find them, to, to try and go to Jesus and bring him back down to heaven and say, Jesus, how do we get saved? Or to bring him up from the, from the pit. How do we get saved? No, no, no. It, it's here. I, we're telling you how to get saved. It's right in front of you. And what is that word of faith by which we're saved? 
Verse 6, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the word of faith. It's here. It was there in 57 AD. It was there when Jesus preached to the masses in Galilee and down in Judea. This is the word of faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so Paul is saying salvation, justification by faith is available to everyone, Jew and Gentile. It's right here. Believe in the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in his crucifixion and his resurrection for your sin and for your life. And you will be saved. You don't need to do any more than that. But to trust, to put your faith in in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. But that's not what the nation of Israel believes. They reject God's way of salvation, and they continue to pursue their own way of salvation, that is, by earning it through keeping the law, which will never result in their salvation, which will never result in their gaining a right standing before God. But in order to be saved, what do people need? They need to hear the word of faith. They need to hear the gospel. And so is it possible that that's that's why Israel as a nation is not yet saved? Is it possible that they did not hear the gospel? And that's why they're not yet saved. Paul in verses 14 through 21 in the last section of this chapter He's dealing with the fact that Israel has heard and rejected the word of faith, which is now going out to the Gentile nations as God warned. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Verse 14. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preached the good news. How did you come to faith in Jesus? How did you come to faith in Jesus? Someone explained the good news to you. It might have been a friend. It may have been from this pulpit or from the pulpit of another church. It may may have been your father. It may have been your mother. It may have been your brother or sister. It may have been Billy Graham. It may have been Chuck Smith. It may have been Greg Laurie. Or it may have been through reading that you did, such as uh, Stranger on the Road to Emmaus or another gospel pamphlet. Whatever the case, you came to faith in Jesus Christ because someone else explained the word of faith. Amen? Amen? Praise God for that person who is faithful to preach the gospel. Now, this is what Paul is affirming in verses 14 through 15. The way of faith, salvation is open to Jews and Gentiles alike through faith in Jesus Christ. But what do every Jew and Gentile need? They need to hear. They need to hear the good news. They need to hear the word of faith, that through Jesus Christ, who is God, who died on the cross and rose again, you can have life and life eternal with God through faith in what Jesus has done for you. They have to hear that message. Now, isn't it interesting, why is Paul writing the letter he is to the church in Rome? Because he wants them to partner with him and send him to preach the gospel to the western parts of the Roman Empire in Spain. All right, now let's think about this. 
Some people, when they hear the doctrine of election, which we studied last week, that God elects those who will be saved, and if God elects a person to salvation, they will be saved, then some people reach the conclusion, why bother sharing the gospel with other people? Because they're going to get saved whether I share the gospel with them or not. So it doesn't matter what I do. They're going to get saved, and those who are not elect by God are not going to get saved whether I preach the gospel or not. They're not going to get saved any, anyway. So why do we bother preaching the gospel? Now maybe some of you have had those same thoughts or objections when you heard the doctrine of election. God's election basically negates his method. But what do we see in the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul is the one who taught us the doctrine of election in chapter 9. But it's the Apostle Paul who is affirming that without the preaching of the gospel, no one gets saved. And he's given his whole life to preaching the gospel, though he understands election very clearly. He's also committed to the preaching of the gospel. He wants the church in Rome to partner with him and to send him so he can preach the gospel to people who have not yet heard, to the elect in the western part of the empire. What are we seeing? We're seeing that balance that I'm calling all of us to, to hold in balance the antinomy of God's sovereignty, which includes the doctrine of election, and human responsibility, which teaches that each person who is elect must hear the gospel and freely put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And both are true. Both are reflected here in Romans 9 and 10. And so if you have been of the mindset that you reject the election because it means that you shouldn't preach the gospel or vice versa, you're out of balance. Both are true. Now, can I explain the point of intersection where they meet? No, I can't. But God's appointed method of salvation is the preaching of the gospel. The elect must hear the gospel in order to be saved. Does that make sense? And we see it so clearly here. We see it modeled in the Apostle Paul. And so we should be a people who remain committed to sharing the gospel at every opportunity. Because that is the method that God has ordained for the elect to be saved. And how do we want to treat every person in our sphere of influence? How do we want to relate to every person in our sphere of influence? As if they were the elect. Okay? And so we just see it so clearly here in the Apostle Paul. Now, again, it, it comes down to this question. People must hear the word of faith in order to be saved, and national Israel isn't saved, so is it possible that national Israel did not hear the gospel, the word of faith? Look with me at verses 16 through 18. Paul goes on to write, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. That's an understatement. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Now that comes from Isaiah 53, which is a detailed description of Israel's rejection of the Messiah, the Messiah's death for the iniquities of the nation, and of his resurrection. A clear and powerful prophecy introducing the Messiah and his work. That was given seven centuries before Jesus came. And so what Paul is saying is, they have not all believed, but they have heard the gospel. They heard it from Isaiah. They heard it when Jesus came on the scene and fulfilled Isaiah 53. He goes on to say, verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ but I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the end of the world. What Paul is saying is, the gospel has gone out to the nation of Israel. It went out to the nation of Israel through Isaiah in the 8th century BC. It went out to Israel again through the coming of Jesus at his first coming. They have no excuse. They have heard the word of faith. The problem is not a lack of hearing. The problem is what? 
a lack of believing. Now, Israel's unbelief was not a surprise to God. And in fact, God warned them that a day would come that because of their unbelief, he would put them on the sideline and he would bring his salvation to the Gentiles. Notice what he says in verses 19 through 21. But I asked, did Israel not understand? And the question there is, did Israel not understand that the Gentile nations were going to be saved, that God was going to take his salvation to the Gentile nations, that as he said in verse 30 of chapter 9, that Gentiles would one day uh, gain a righteousness that they themselves did not pursue. Why? Because God would bring his salvation. He was sidelining Israel. He would bring his salvation to the Gentile nations. But I asked, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so, so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. That is the Gentile nations to whom the gospel is now spreading. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Do you understand, historically, the reason why God chose the Israelites was that they would be his witness to all the Gentile nations of the earth. Do you realize where God put the nation of Israel? The promised land is on the trade route that connects the African continent with the Asian continent and the European continent. God did that on purpose so that the trade caravans that came from all the nations of the earth at that time would travel right through Israel. And as they observed Israel keeping covenant with God, walking in righteousness, treating each other with justice, their worship was beautiful, God pouring out his blessings on the nation in terms of their agricultural abundance, their security and so on, they would ask this question, who is your God? And then the Jews would have the joy of sharing with them Yahweh, the one true God, so that the Gentile nations could be saved through faith in Yahweh. But did Israel do that historically? No. And particularly after they returned to the land, after the exile by the Babylonians, that's when they particularly turned inward and saw the Gentile nations as a threat, not as a field to be cultivated for God. And so this also explains the partial hardening. They have failed in their mission that God gave them, and God told them there's coming a day when because of your failure, I am going to go directly to the Gentile nations that they might be saved. And that's another reason for the partial hardening. God is putting Israel on the sideline and he's sending the gospel out through other means during the dispensation of grace. Does that make sense? And so Israel's failure was not a surprise. Oh, I can't believe my people didn't know. It was known by God. Clear back in the days of Moses, he prophesies. There's coming a day when God's going to make them jealous because he's going to bring salvation to them and leave Israel on the sideline. All right, we've covered a lot of ground here. We went through an entire chapter of Scripture. Plus, I should get a raise. <laughs> Elders. So what we're seeing here is in Romans 9, we're seeing Paul explain from God's sovereignty, from, from that side of the coin, why is it that so few Jews are trusting in Jesus Christ during this dispensation? And why are the majority not? It's because of the election of the remnant and the hardening of the rest as God brings salvation to the Gentile nations. Chapter 10 teaches us the reason why so few Jews trust in Christ and the vast majority reject him is because of Israel's unbelief. Rejection of Messiah and rejection of justification by faith. 
That's why they're in this situation, and that's why God is sidelining them and bringing his salvation directly to the Gentile nations, okay, through other means. Now, in closing, two other things I want to share with you. We're clear through this wonderful example that we have here, we're clear that as we seek to hold the antinomy of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, as we seek to hold those in balance, we see it modeled by the Apostle Paul. And particularly with regard to our sharing the gospel with others, God's election does not negate God's method. God's election does not negate God's method. What is God's method for people coming to faith in Jesus Christ? Through the preaching of the gospel. And so we must be a people committed to share the gospel, the way of salvation, with every unsaved person in our sphere of influence. Amen? And then finally this morning, this passage is all about God's salvation, his desire for a relationship with each one of us. And so this morning, if you have a desire for a relationship with God, know that God has a desire for a relationship with you. And that he's made the way through Jesus Christ for you to be reconciled to him. You see, it's your sin that separates you from God. Your sin, my sin, is evil. God is white, hot, holy, and pure. And so Jesus Christ came and took your sin and died and he paid the penalty and removed your sin as a barrier between you and God. He died, he rose again on the third day, proving that God accepted his payment on your behalf and on mine. And if we will believe that, God in his grace will forgive all of our sin and his spirit will come to live in our lives, in your life. And you will be with God for all eternity. So trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in him today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your great love for us. Lord Jesus, thank you for your great love for the Father and your great love for us. That you would suffer what you suffered willingly that we might be saved. I pray for anyone here today, Holy Spirit, that you would continue to draw them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then give us the joy this week of sharing the way of salvation with those who are not yet saved in our sphere of influence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.